Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. My name is Cindy Duell, and I am a digital outreach specialist with the Jamestown Rediscovery Foundation. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about the Virtual Fort Project. So I want to start off to give you a little bit of background about Jamestown as a whole, in case you are unfamiliar with it before I dive right into the project specifically. Um, so it starts out the the APVA was the first statewide historic preservation organization created in the United States. The APVA stands for the Association for Preservation of Virginia Antiquities, which is now referred to as Preservation Virginia. It was founded in 1889 by Mary Jeffrey Galt and Cynthia Beverly Tucker Coleman to preserve and protect Virginia's landmarks. In 1893, the APVA acquired their primary property, which is Jamestown, <clears throat> the site of the first permanent English settlement in North America. Later that year, Edward and Louise Barney uh, donated 22 and a half acres of Jamestown Island to the APVA, including the ruins of the iconic 17th century brick church tower. In 1934, the National Park Service acquired the remaining 1500 acres of Jamestown Island that are combined a combination of woods and wetlands. So that's what you're seeing here. The green portion is the, um, the National Park Service property and the yellowy color is what uh, Preservation Virginia owns today. Preservation Virginia began the Jamestown Rediscovery Project in 1994 to prepare for the 400th anniversary of the colony which would be in uh, 2007. With the discovery of the archeological remains of the James Fort, Preservation Virginia and the National Park Service planned the implementation and expansion plan to support research and interpretation of the site. This includes the Archearium, the Research Center, the Visitor Center, and the Interpretive Landscape. So this is a nice drone shot of the island to give you a little perspective if you've been out here today. Um, you can see towards the middle of the image is the footbridge, which you would walk over from the visitor center to the main portion of the island, which includes the, uh, the James Fort, which you see in the bottom of the computer. And then on to the right of the screen, off screen is the National Park Service property. So I wanna give you a little background of the evolution of the fort over time. So I have a couple of slides here that will go somewhat quickly to show you some of the archaeology and lead up to the time period specifically that we're going to look at today. So this is the island um, in the archaeology research, what would have been in June of 1607, and it starts out as a three-sided fort. You can see as it evolves over time, there are more buildings in place. Um, there's a little key on the bottom to show the, um, how definite these um, all these structures are or if they're probable or possible depending on what archaeological information we had at that particular date and time. So in the fall of 1608 the fort expands and you can see the fort extension of the palisade wall and it becomes a five-sided fort. And then the addition of more buildings over time. And then in 1617 began the construction of the uh, second church on Jamestown Island. So this, um, the green building you see on the right in the fort extension is what we're going to be talking about specifically today. So I want to give you a little background of the virtual fort in itself and what this project is. Um, it's a new initiative develop, to develop 3D models of the James Fort at significant points in its history. The 3D modeling involves using architectural software to virtually recreate historical structures and objects based on archaeological evidence, documentary sources, and comparative examples. So in this particular church, it was built in 1617, but we are going to look at it in the year 1619. This is when the General Assembly took place in this church. The first General Assembly met in the choir, which is a, um, was a newly built wooden church at Jamestown in 1619, um, and the General Assembly began on June 30th. It's, it was the first represented governing body to meet in North America and is the oldest continuing lawmaking body of government in the Western Hemisphere. 
but now specifically to the virtual church project. So we start off with a research model um, in AutoCAD. And this is where I create basic geometry of the overall shape, something to give starting of the overall size and scale of the building. The windows and doors are then cut into this research model. And the information is based on any archeological excavation and historical references that may exist on this building. The next phase that we go into is more detailed of the framing. Here you can see the underlying structure of the framing and the, this church in particular is a close studded of an architectural style, which means that the studs and the rafters are placed very close together. In modern day construction, they're on average 16 inches apart, where you can see these are a lot closer together than um, a house built today would be. So and you can see in this particular one, um, to give you um, perspective on the location, the left side of the screen is the west. And in this model, we have a door to the west. And you can see there's a central aisle in the building. And then there's right um, on the right is the southeast door. This is what we believe the building would be at this point in time, based on all of the evidence that we had. Now, while I'm building this building virtually, um, the archaeologists are also digging the site of this church. So we're learning things, I'm learning things as they're learning things, and we're putting this into a virtual model together. So then we decided to add a door on the southwest, which is what you see now. You see these four, um, sorry, these three rectangular shapes in the buildings. These are the doors. Um, and then I started adding the plaster to the shape, which as you see now all filled in from the studs. We'll go back here. So where the studs are open. So now this fills in all of the plaster. Once we have all of the structural elements um, together, then this goes from a program, this is done in AutoCAD, to a different program called 3D Studio Max. In this program, this is where I can um, add things to enhance the models. These are photorealistic textures, and you can add environmental features, and you can simulate lighting. And this is what I was talking about where you can make it at a particular point in history. Based on the lighting, you can look at um, you know, historical maps to see where the, the sun was and locations, and then a particular time of day where the sun may be, how bright it would be, and that sort of thing. So you can really pinpoint exactly where you want to represent it. So in this particular one, in the detailed image on the side, you can see that I've added, started adding the wood texture to the wood framing. Previously, all of the elements are done in particular colors. The colors don't really mean anything. It's just to differentiate the structural elements from one another. So as we started working on more things, we were having, um, we had what's called um, monthly design review meetings where I meet with the archeologists and I show what I'm working on. And we then go over the evidence to see if everything's lining up. And early on in this project, we noticed that certain things weren't lining up, which was leading to more questions. These questions then led the archeology span team to go back and do more research. They were digging in the church tower um, to try to find the west wall. Previously, we could not find where the west wall was located. In digging that preserved underneath the concrete floor in the church tower was in fact the west wall. What this led to um, finding was that the church was shifted, um, that was shifted 10 degrees to the west of where we originally thought it would be. So that's what you're seeing here. The green rectangle is where we originally thought the church was and the red rectangle superimposed on top is now where that church is. You can see it's shifted to the west. Once this was shifted and we went back and I overlaid my model on top of the archeological research, everything was lining up to where it was supposed to, where we thought it was and everything was falling into place literally. So with this new information, I went back and updated the model. So you can see here, 
um, within uh, these ovals, the original space, we had three doors along the exterior and with the new information, realized that there was not a central aisle. There was no longer a west door. So if you can see, it's hard to see a little bit, but if you can see where the inside of it on the left model, there is a darker red aisle down the middle of the floor. And in the right model, it's not, it's all dark brown. We removed that. Those right now is representing, the brown represents wood and the red represents brick. So that is what is represented here and how it has changed based on new archeology. span So what that does is not only is this a research tool to help when it's completed and help represent the archeology span when the full project is finished. But in the meantime, this allows um, the archeologists to really get a different perspective of what they're looking at in the ground and what that would be superimposed above the ground. And then you can really see what things line up, what things don't line up, and it really gives a different perspective of the research that you're finding and will lead to new information. So it's a, it's, it's a research tool when it's completed, but it's a research tool along the way as well. So here's a close up image of that second one that was on the right. So you can see more that we've now taken out that west wall, uh, west door, and it is believed that there were two southern doors, one on the west side and one on the right, uh, on the east side. And while some of these features are going to be speculative, it is hard to know where a window was in particular with archaeology. You don't have the same cut ins the way you would with a door. Um, our archaeologists also had several trips to England where they were able to look at period appropriate examples and get an overall um, sense of what the architectural style was for that period in multiple examples. So anywhere that we didn't have archaeology ourselves were filled in with that information from um, the period appropriate examples. So here you can see, I again took that framing from the simple AutoCAD model and moved it into the complex software where now all of this that is represented by wood um, timber is now textured with wood texturing. You can see below that there is the bricks, um, but also that a portico was added to the Western door and a belfry was added to the western portion of the structure. This is because this church did not have the church tower. That was a later addition. There were multiple churches on this site over, his, over time. Um, at the end, I will include a resource that you can learn more about that later. But um, this particular church had a belfry as opposed to a separate bell tower. So here you can see I've added that plaster that we added before, but now this has a particular um, plaster texture on it. And it really can show you this timber framing um, as well as the thatched roof on the main portion with the shingle on the belfry. You can really see the textures coming to life here. So once the overall building itself is completed, then we move on to the interior of the building and this includes some of the furniture. So these are some of the period appropriate examples I was talking about. So these were some benches that the archaeologists found in England that were of the same period. You can see the close studding on the building itself. You can see the plaster in between those studs. And um, they were able to document these benches for me and brought back all of their information and I digitally reconstructed these benches for the church, which is what you can see in the right image. This is another um, example of the pews that you would see. So in this particular church, there are pews in what is the choir and there are regular benches in the body of the church. This is a differentiation of why there are two different types. Now it's a little harder to see, but on the left image, the second um, pew is where you see the carving on this. And this is what's pulled again from this on the right. 
So here's a close up detail of that particular carving. The one on the left is very worn, um, but because the building on the right is supposed to be shown as the building is only two years old, I modeled it how it would be brand new. And this is a close representation of what the carvings would be. So now I started putting in these, um, these pews into the church. And you can see here that these are, the texturing is starting to begin on the inside as well, as you saw in the other ones that was beginning on the exterior. So I put in these to get the spacing laid out of where they would look and the textures are on the benches as well. So now I've gone back and done some more flooring. So if you can see the difference, I'm gonna back up here. So this is just a color coded basically to tell the difference between materials. And this is an early test of what it would look like. So this is a basic brick texture and a basic wood texture to give a sort of sense of what the floor would look like before I go and add these super detailed textures on the floor. So now this is here where this is actually specific um, detailed flooring. So I'll back up again so you can see the difference. You see how this very simple flooring on um, the wood here, and this is very detailed planks laid out. Also the bricks, the bricks that you can see um, in the church, is, I worked with the curators in this and was able to pull samples of the bricks that the archaeologists found in, out of the ground, and I was able to color match them. So while these bricks are not exactly you know, this blue brick is in this particular blue location because a lot of the floor did not remain. What I was able to do is use the pieces that we had and fill in the rest to be that same pattern of how the bricks would have laid out and then used actually Jamestown bricks to put into this church to represent all of the bricks that were found. So these colors are based on actual colors from the church that was excavated. So this particular church, I mentioned earlier that we were representing what it would have looked like in the summer of 1619 during the first general assembly. Um, based on the image that I showed prior of um, the paintings from that time period, this is what we believe that the layout would have looked. So you can see um, how the chairs and the table where the governor would have sat. And now you see the bar that separates the choir from the body of the church. You can now see the revised textures um, on the pews, as well as the benches that are in the body of the church. So you can see more detailed um, layout of this. And here is a view of what would look like if you went in the western door and you looked straight down the aisle of the church. This is what you would see. And you can also see the palisade wall right outside um, that east window. You can see just how close that is. And if you look closely on the windows on the side, you can even see the sunlight coming through the windows. So one of the other uh, aspects to some of these details is 3D scanning. So what I have done here is, if you can see on the left image, is a fragment of the original bell. This was found in the excavations of the church. And I 3D scanned this to create a virtual bell, which is what's represented in the middle image. While we, I was working on this, we were also working on creating an exhibit in the church. Um, so on the right, you can see a reproduction bell that was created in a local foundry in Virginia, um, the Sunderland Foundation, um, Sunderland Foundry, excuse me, um, recreated a physical bell to put back into the actual church that exists 
in on Jamestown Island today. Um, so you can see we both used that fragment to physically reconstruct it and digitally reconstruct it. Now I would like to play for you an animation that I did that walks you in through the west door, down the central aisle, and at back out the east door. Um, so this is the completed building, as you see. Um, as I mentioned before, sometimes these things are often conjecture that we don't know 100% of everything that would be in the building, particularly the windows. It's harder to know where those would be. Um, as I said, we used historic examples or any historical documentation or um, any writings that were done to represent what the buildings would be. But the benefit of a virtual model is also that as things change and as we do more research and any further excavation, we can always change things. As you saw, we had several changes over time um, based on new archaeological evidence and the virtual model can constantly be updated depending on the new findings. Um, and that is the uh, huge beneficial resource for the archaeologists to see their work come to life and give a virtual representation of all of their work. So these are some resources um, that you can continue to look at. Um, I've included more information on the first General Assembly, which was held in this church. Um, there's more information on the virtual church that we just showed you today and the virtual fort project as a whole. There will be more buildings to come in the future and I hope you learn, enjoyed learning what you uh, were shown today. And if you have any questions, uh, I am here to answer them. That was awesome. Um, Thank you. I had a, I had a question. Okay. Um, can you give us an idea on the time frame it takes to model certain things? Sure. Um, the modeling process is a very time consuming process. Um, I have worked at uh, Jamestown Rediscovery for three years now, and this has been my main project. Um, while it starts out, the research models um, are relatively easy. There's a lot that goes into it because of based on evidence. And then, as I said, we have the design reviews that we will review things over and over. So certain things can take months to flesh out. Um, but the, the, and the details, um, I mean, the, the benches themselves, I think is, is a small example. The benches um, took about two weeks to get everything wow. right. The textures laid out, okay. the geometry. Um, so there's a lot of work that goes into this and the more detailed, um, the more elaborate that they are, the longer it takes to do. Gotcha. Um, and it's, I, like you said, it must be just so helpful to be able to go into a computer to make changes, like as you're learning things versus like maybe something by hand would require like a lot more time to like reimagine. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, even though I just said it takes a while to do, if you were to physically reconstruct this, it would take you double, maybe even three times the amount to physically recreate what I'm doing. So mm -hmm. while this is time intensive, it is the most efficient way to represent it. 
but also it gives you a way to see things. So you can, the, the archeologists can really learn from what they're seeing in a different perspective. You know, they're looking at things um, from 2D or, you know, bird's eye view. I can really turn the model and look, we can go underneath and look at it from, you know, the ground up and you can see things from a different perspective that makes them look at what they're doing differently and maybe learn something from that and then mm -hmm. learn things from their new research. So it's a very back and forth process. It's very um, give and take and we all can learn things from it to end up with the, um, the best quality uh, building, best research information that we have um, going forward. Gotcha. Um, I also had a second question. Okay. What is your favorite part of doing this? Like what gives you the most joy when you're working on this project? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, Sorry. <laughs> I think, no, that, that's a great question because I mean, I, I have been doing this for a long, long time and I love what I do. I, I think the, the most exciting part is to see someone that maybe doesn't have as much whether it's architectural or archaeological background, be able to understand what we're talking about, whether that's me or whether that's an archaeologist or any of my other colleagues, you can really see what they're talking about with this visual representation. Mm -hmm. I think it makes it a lot easier to understand, you know, particularly if you're looking at an excavation, you're looking at, you know, a hole in the ground. And then if you're not a person in this, this field, um, you know, with years of schooling and that sort of thing. This is how we can get it to the general public. And this is the, in, the way we can share information that more people are able to understand. Um, but it also kind of gives a face to the project, so to speak. You can really see, you know, this really is a tool to represent all of the work that the archaeologists do, but bring it to life. That, that's what it, that's what excites me the most and really bringing it to life and you can really represent in a different way um all of the work that goes into a project like this yeah absolutely um oh james harrison says wonderful program thank you very much um thank you. if anybody has any questions please feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hands using the reactions button um and you can answer it with your voice if you'd like um I will, oh, okay. Emily says, what about this project has surprised you the most? I think going in, um, you know, I collected all of the information that we had in the beginning because there were previous excavations done. So that's usually where I start. Um, I think I was most excited or most surprised by the discovery of the West Wall. For so long, we didn't know where the, the boundaries of the church were. We didn't know where that ending was. So to, to have this understanding of kind of where does the, the doors lay out and where does this all fit in and not being able to quite line it up the way that we thought it would, by then moving the building 10 feet and seeing everything it, it was like a, a light bulb went off. You can really see this is exactly what we're seeing. This is what the archeologists see when they're out there. This is really what transpires in this building to bring it to life and um, to just to be able to have everything line up the way that we were hoping it would, That because that doesn't always happen. Sometimes you, you don't know and you do your best to represent based on the information you have at that moment so when that really all came um, came through and you could really see it line up the way that we all thought it would, that was just really exciting. That that was great to find that. Um, I have another question. I, I have two program or two questions. Um, okay. Emily Hamburg would like to know your background and formal training that brought you to this neat project. Um, was it architecture or? Yes, yeah, so I have a bachelor's in architecture. Um, it's specifically architectural design and build. So I learned how to draw plans, but I also learned how to physically build buildings, whether that's wood construction, steel construction um, from a technical school um, in upstate New York. And then I also have a master's degree in historic preservation. 
um, that I got in Savannah, Georgia. So um, it really brought in my knowledge and my love of old buildings to see how they're constructed, but also learn about different uh, construction styles and building styles uh, throughout the different centuries, um, particularly in the United States. Um, so yeah, it really it brings in my two passions by doing this. It's architecture and digital preservation. Cool. Um, I have another question uh, from Linda. She says, can you explain why you moved the door from the west wall to having two doors on one side? Okay, so when we started with the west uh, door based on what we had thought based on other examples from the time. Um, as I said, we at that point in time, we did not know the location of the west wall, but based on other research, this is where we all were sort of assuming that it would be. So as we were digging and um, as the archeologists went to multiple examples, we were finding more and more that there were multiple doors on one side. So that led to further excavation. So the, our archeologists were digging um, on that Western side. And sure enough, they found information to prove that there was in fact a door on that side. So um, that being said, with then also the discovery of the West Wall and that Western Wall was not broken as to um, which would you would normally see if there was a door, all of that information proved together that the door in fact was on the um, western portion of the south wall rather than the west wall. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, does anybody have any more questions before I ask my final one? Anyone? I'll wait a couple minutes, let's see. Okay, I'm gonna ask my question. Okay. What is, what is your least favorite texture to work with in this design program? Oh. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think it tend, uh, probably metals. Okay. To get metals to be, whether it's as accurately as shiny or rusty or tarnished or whatever it may be to make it look random, but also be realistic um, can be quite tricky. Texturing is one of those things that when you look at it, it often just looks right. And you may not even notice the details. You just look at it and it looks right. Mm -hmm. When a texture is wrong, it stands out like a sore thumb. You, you definitely will know. So something say a floor texture, if the floor texture looks right, you might not even look at it and think twice. But if it's wrong, you know it's wrong. <laughs> um, so I think that kind of, maybe not necessarily specifically, like I said, metal is one of the most tricky, but it's just making it look natural, making it look organic and randomized enough that it doesn't look repetitive and it doesn't look fake. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it looks like we did have another question come into the chat. Okay. Um, Don would like to know, can modeling be used to show how the church may have deteriorated over time? Um, yes, you certainly could do that. Um, that is not something that I have done at this particular moment in time. Um, as I mentioned, I was showing this church as two years old. So I was showing it relatively new. But yes, absolutely. You can add things um, such as dirt. You can um, add things, like I said, with metal, you can add rusting. Um, if you have something that's, say, copper, you can show it as the patinaed green. You know, when copper starts out as, um, you know, shiny, um, and then over time it turns green. So you can really show a lot of different things. You can show sort of natural wear, you can show deterioration. It, it really just depends on what is your end goal? What are you trying to show with a particular model? As I said, this one, our goal was to represent what the church looked like when the first General Assembly was there and therefore a relatively new church. But yes, absolutely, you can show anything over time and you can show it brand new. And then side by side, you can show what it would have looked like deteriorated as well. So it's really just what is your goal 
for the model. Awesome. Um, I'm going to wait a couple more seconds to see if any okay. other questions come in. This has been so informative and so neat. Thank you. Yep, this, a lot of the welding. project is ongoing. So the stay tuned for more on the virtual fort as a whole. Um, I'm still working on new things to come. Gotcha. Yep, a lot of thank yous, a lot of well done. It's very informative. Um, so with that, I think we're going to end the program unless there's any more last minute questions. Um, thank you so much, Cindy, for this. Um, I, I'm sure our patrons learned a lot. Um, and thank it's you just for been, having me. Yeah, it's just been really cool to see and something so close, so close to us. Yes, uh, while Historic Jamestown is currently closed, um, you can follow us on social media to see when we are open. And you can see there is an exhibit within the Memorial Church right now, which is the Brick Church. Um, there is an exhibit that goes along with this project that you can see when we do reopen. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cindy. Thank you.